Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody's having a great weekend. Happy Mother's Day uh, to all you beautiful mothers who do so much, uh, oftentimes with so little. Thank you. Uh, this is a day of celebration and, and I'm sitting here and, you know, in my space and I'm actually working and I'm sitting up and I'm thinking and um, I decided to have this brief conversation or brief monologue so to speak uh, to talk to you guys to take a little journey so to speak uh, for some time now I have been announcing that we are in the midst of a fundraiser and Consistently, there's little to no support for those of you who have uh, supported me, not just in the recent months, but at any time. I want to tell you I appreciate your vote of confidence uh, because that's what it amounts to me more than anything is that. Now, I don't need validation for my work. It speaks for itself. I've been consistent. Uh, matter of fact, that's something that I hear a lot. It's like, man, you are consistent. You uh, have been consistent through the years, and I have. Uh, I've personally logged just in the realm of studying the black situation. 80,000 hours of academic and scientific research. Not for the purpose of running around talking about how much I know. Not for the purpose of intellectual pissing contests with other people. But for the purpose of devising strategies, creating programs, and creating solutions to the enigmatic issues that we face as a people. I have uh, searched... Um, the answers for uh, black poverty and the widening of the racial wealth gap, the need for generational wealth, the need for economic empowerment. I have studied the miseducation of our children. I have studied mass incarceration, gentrification, serial force displacement. I have uh, looked at multi-generational transmission of trauma. I have studied the uh, proclivity of African-American adolescent and young adult males towards violence and what drives that. And I have presented programs. I have presented solutions. I have, uh, with great intensity and consistency, given myself to be a resource and an advocate in the community, oftentimes uh, following up for mothers, uh, distressed mothers who are struggling with issues predominantly with their sons, but also daughters. I have worked with young black women uh, to deal with the struggles of childhood sexual abuse and the outcomes as an adult. Uh, I still do that. I have worked with them in depression. I've worked with young men and still work with young men, black men and young black boys uh, dealing with depression and mental illness and it's a problem it's a growing and intensifying problem and there is a need for resources in our community to meet this challenge and I've talked to you about the numbers uh, does it bother me that there's so little support for programs like the ones that I have at the Odyssey Project actually it doesn't surprise me uh, it doesn't surprise me because it's par for the course. We will get behind big name things, the shiny things, the trumped up things we get behind, but the things that have the intrinsic value, the things that bring about change, the things that you can look at and say work will get no traction uh, because it's simply the way that things are set up. Black Lives Matter raped the hell out of the community, well over a hundred million dollars, um, built on the blood of Mike Brown predominantly. And 
almost rejuvenated on the blood of George Floyd. Yet, little to no uh, true uh, results of what happened with that money as it pertains to the servicing of the needs of the black community and the fighting of, uh, of forces that uh, culminate in the senseless killing of black males. And, 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 and don't get me wrong, I'm not one to sit up and think that the biggest problem is the outside. The biggest problem is the inside. And I've told you that how many times that if there is no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. You've heard me say that over and over again. And I'm, I'm, I'm keenly cognizant of the fratricide in the community, uh, black male violence, uh, against black male and even intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide, something else I've been a very strong voice for for years, written about it, published it, spoke on it, created programs to help uh, try to mitigate it. Um, I've been consistent in my work. My work is searchable. My work is prolific. And I've predominantly funded my own work and I will do whatever I have to do, but I feel I've earned the right to challenge my people to support because what I have done, I think, is remarkable. And uh, while I'm not looking for any pats on the back, every dollar that somebody donates, and I mean the person who's donated a dollar and people do to the person who's donated uh, whatever amount. I appreciate it first and foremost because it takes you believing in what we are doing to be willing to make that sacrifice. And I think anybody taking from something for themselves to give to something else is a sacrifice. But I think that sacrifice is a requisite to empowerment. See, the sacrifice is an acknowledgement of connectivity and a sense of interest in what is going on. And when we sacrifice and give of ourselves to something outside of our immediate periphery that we don't immediately and directly connect to like marriage and family, it's saying that I see myself in this thing beyond my immediate periphery and I have a responsibility to do more than talk about it. I have a responsibility to do more than complain about it. I have a responsibility to actually uh, take action and invest in a future that will uh, provide an environment for my progeny, my offspring, my descendants, in a way that gives them a better situation than the one I inherited. Mm -hmm. And this is um, this is something that I am really pushing for. We need your support. You know, I've kind of gotten away from in the videos the last few weeks, bringing it up in, in my videos. Obviously, if I do the post-production on a video, it's in the video to support us. Um, but I mean, literally uh, $10 here, $5 there. And I mean, that's not consistent. That's not on a daily basis. That's might be a month, literally. And to me, it's... We're doing what we're doing. My concern is while I'm touching people, while I'm helping people, and I can be satisfied in that, but I'm not satisfied because I see the bigger picture. I see a need for a national rite of passage. I see a need for a network of resources for mental illness and mental health around this country. I see so many things that can be done with the proper resources, with the proper planning. Uh, but we're sitting around and everybody's waiting on someone else to do it. No one will. And then when someone is willing to do it, nobody's willing to get behind them. There's so much distrust except for where it should be placed. I watch us spend billions 
into spaces that don't have anything good for us. They don't support our interests. Matter of fact, they are the resources that are withheld from us. And they are the controllers of the resources that are withheld from us. And yet we constantly finance our own demise while refusing to invest in our empowerment. And it's a sense and a representation of just where we are as a race of people and why it's so easily to oppress us, why it's so easily to manipulate us, why it's so easy to uh, mis misdirect and misguide us. It's because we don't see the need to create agendas, strategies and plans that will put us in a better position to take strides towards this level of liberation and freedom and empowerment that we consistently talk about, uh, but we are moving further away from because we simply don't know how to come together. So yes, this weekend and for the next week, I am challenging you guys to break the norm break the norm, support the work we do, give. Um, if you need, like I said, uh, I put the uh, link to the organization and then you can see the work we do. Stroll this channel and look, but Google the work we do. I literally, every week, work with black people in our community that are struggling and suffering. That's not a week that goes by. That's not a day that goes by that something doesn't come to my desk about some issue that needs to be confronted and people are asking me to take it on. And I had to sort of reel myself back because I was literally killing myself because the only person that I can say do this for free to is me. I can't ask anybody else to do something for free. So when, when there's no resources, guess who has to saddle up and say, man, I'm going to figure it out and go do it. And I realized I was damn near killing myself. This year I had to take a two-year, uh, I mean a two-week uh, mental health break. And as someone who literally champions mental health and is a mental health professional, I'm glad I did. Uh, it really illuminated the importance of my own mental and emotional health and uh, while I'm striving and fighting to do all the things that I'm trying to do, it made me realize that I need to take care of self. I need to be more aware of what's going on with me and my health. Uh, man, you know, a lot has happened over the last year or so. Man, I've dropped 50 pounds, got in the gym, got in shape, still got a ways to go to get the body that I'm building, but a long way from where I was. Uh, heart is a lot healthier after those heart attacks. I mean, think about the things that I fought through to keep being who I am in this world. And I look up and I see we are in a situation where the wealth gap, racial wealth gap is widening. We're in a situation where public school systems are being shut down um, and access to a quality academic education is becoming more and more difficult to access for lower income black families. Um, I've written about this in the miseducation of black youth. I've written about it in academic apartheid. I've lectured on it. There are a number of articles out there. We have a problem. We have a problem in uh, mental health. We have a 49% uh, increase in black male suicides in the age range of 14 to 24. Our baby girls from 5 to 13 lead in the statistical category of suicide. Yes, young black girls are killing themselves at very early ages. And we are not properly socializing our babies. We're not properly preparing them for this unbelievable force that, that's hitting them when they walk outside of the confines of our homes. And there's ways to do this. We have to prepare the mind and the psyche to be able to withstand the pressures that it will face or it will crumble. 
Um, it was uh, Frederick Douglass that said that uh, it is much easier to prepare and build strong children than to, rep to repair broken men. And yet we are constantly in that space now. Uh, it's easy to sit up and look at what happens when a young black man snaps and harms a black woman, which is an absolute unacceptable act to me. But nobody wants to ask how he got there. He wasn't born that way. So then what process, what environment, what reality and situation groomed him to be that? What type of socialization has he experienced where the, re the response to what he deems as rejection is violence? What happened to what should be a natural thrust to protect? It was never socialized into him. He feels powerless. And the one thing that anything powerless, uh, any one powerless does is when they're feeling powerless, they go to the one place where they feel powerful. When a woman is in a situation with a man, she can't overpower him. What does she do? She goes to her power, her mouth. He's in a situation where his only power is violence, whether it's in violence because he feels powerless economically, whether he feels powerless socially or relationally, he's acting out. I did years and years of research into African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. The Black Man Lead Rite of Passage Initiative is an actual direct uh, response to the research I've done on African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. There's an answer to it. We can reduce the violence through proper socializations. The science is there. The, 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 the case studies are there. I've done it. We can not only just reduce violence through rite of passage, we can also reduce uh, incarceration and criminalization. We can increase uh, pro-social behavior. We can increase increase the proclivity to become business owners. We can increase the proclivity to be able to create and sustain a black family. All of these things through proper socialization. We are missing a major, but that's a reason why the successful groups in this world who are exhibiting significant amounts of power have rites of passage for their young males. You don't want to leave that up to chance, what they're going to become, what they're, stri what they're aspiring to be. And you've got to understand that the black male is in this dilemma of growing up and, and having 1.5 million men missing in the community, most of which 1.3 are incarcerated, 1.3 million are incarcerated. Others have just checked out or not good models. And so you look at them and the only models they have are the celebrities that they see in rap music, the celebrities they see in sports and entertainment. And what they're doing is they're trying to mimic behavior that isn't conducive to living a good life isn't conducive to creating a positive outcome in their lives. And, and they are getting the repercussions of taking on an identity that isn't suited for them because we've failed them. Yes, I have written in great detail about racism. Racism exists. I'm never going to be the person to sit up and say that racism is an illusion and that we need to stop complaining about racism. We need to get over slavery and all that. No, I think if you follow my work, if you look at Born in Captivity, which was my 19th book, if you look at Undoing the African-American Mind, which was my 23rd book, if you look at those books, you'll see that I'm keenly aware of, uh, of the many machinations that are present as it pertains to racism. Racism is the guardian of the gate for elitism, elitism uh, and classism. And I understand that, but what we cannot do is sit here and uh, become complacent and compliant in a society that's literally designed to keep us suppressed in our potential so that we never become what we're capable of becoming. We have a responsibility to our children to prepare them to be everything that they can be.
We have a responsibility to ourselves to create an environment to where we rise up and live in what we're capable of living. But it's going to take energy, effort, and force. We can't sit up and emotional, emote consistently through anger and rage every time something happens we don't want. That's tantamount to a temper tantrum. And the reason I... I, I make that analogy as a temper tantrum is something thrown by a young kid who hasn't developed the capacity to communicate well and doesn't have any power to create situations they don't want, so they throw fits. The fit is meant to get your attention. The fit is meant to wear you out. The fit is meant to uh, convince you to just give it to them so they'll go away and it, it has so many different thoughts that are going through their little minds. I'm going to throw this fit till I get it. And the, the, the parent who understands that simply lets them throw the fit. America is watching us throw fit after fit after fit because they understand we have no power to do anything about it. It's nothing that kid can do to that parent if that parent doesn't respond, but fall asleep or get up and realize it's not working and walk off. And what happens is we throw these fits. We call them protests. We call them riots. You can call them whatever you want to, but at the end of the day, we've achieved nothing because we cannot execute power because we do not have plans. We do not have agendas. We don't have a blueprint. And, you know, if you go to the site, you'll see the Blueprint 1.0. It's a step-by-step -step process of what it takes to do something, but we are sitting around and we are not executing any form of an agenda. We don't have protocols in place that will govern and dictate our behavior when certain things are going a certain way. We simply have sit around and whined and complained and blamed and, 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 and everything else. And then when someone wants to do something, there's always some reason to find something wrong with them so that we don't have to get behind them. And we have become an easy win for the opposition because we're inactive. We're never going to really truly take action. We just want to complain and we think the noise is enough. They are muted to our complaints. They are muted to our suffering they're muted to our hardships they're muted to our disgust and rage that's not how we're going to create change we're going to have to create change by sitting up and saying we're going to do things differently <laughs>
as a means of weaponizing uh, the academic system against our sons. Our sons have a unique experiences and when they go into a school system, they are as early as five years old identified as being problematic. And, and you're looking about a school, you're looking at a school system where almost 70% of the teachers are white female, you know, somewhere to uh, middle aged, uh, 30s, 40s, 50s. And they have an aversion to black males, even at the age of five. And they're looking for any reason to get them out of the class. And the easiest way to get them out of the class is through special education referral. So they say there's something wrong with the kid. He can't sit still. There's something wrong with the kid. He doesn't follow directions well. There's something wrong with the kid. He, 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 he seems aggressive. And uh, I think he should uh, be uh, assessed for an IEP or some kind of special education designation. And without parents knowing, parents trusting the system, parents are signing off on this, which gives them permission now to double down on your kids. See, see this is what happens. Not only do they make your child a target when they do that. See, what happens is this kid is going to go and he's going to get assessed by a school psychologist that gets paid by the school district. The school district benefits financially by this this uh, special, edu special, education, special education assignment. So that you understand this, when your kid gets uh, uh, designated as being special education, the school gets additional stipend for that as a resource to service their special and unique needs. Most of the time, double the normal average of 8,000. So somewhere around 16,000 versus 8,000. So they're gonna get more money for this. So there is a financial incentive to find something wrong with your kid. And it's disproportionately done to black males. I've written about this on in a position paper entitled, The Disproportionality of Special Education Referrals for Black Boys. But check this out. So then they uh, diagnose using the DSM, uh, this young black male with predominantly two specific things that can be medicated, oppositional defiant disorder and ADHD, uh, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. And what they do is they prescribe them things like Adderall, Ritalin, Concerta, Vivance, um, all of these are what would be, are what we call Schedule Two drugs. They are in the Schedule Two ranking. The higher the, the uh, Schedule ranking, as far as one, is the worse in addiction and usage. Uh, schedule the Schedule model is used to determine the use of a particular drug in medical benefit and its level of addictive. Uh, Influence. So how easy is it to become addicted to it and what are its medical uses? A Schedule 1 is just crap. It is dangerous, addictive, it has no, no metal uses. Schedule 2 drugs are the only reason that you even have them in a Schedule 2 and not a Schedule 1 is predominantly because most of them are opiates, right? Uh, but also cocaine and stimulants. And the only reason they're in there is because they are used in situations like this where they take a stimulant and give it to a kid that they consider to be hyper hyperactive and it tends to have the uh, opposite effects. It tends to slow them down and makes them more docile, more groggy, but it clouds their mind. They're quiet, they're sitting still, but they're not really truly engaged. And these drugs are highly addictive. That's why they're scheduled too. So you're putting them on a drug. Actually, when you look at Vivance, Ritalin, Concerta, uh, uh, Adderall, these are literally one molecule off from being cocaine. Now, it's, 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 it's funny because, and, and I'm saying funny in being facetious, it, it, it's ironic, let's say that, that you're giving this kid a drug that's basically one molecule off of the drug that you jailed his dad for having possession of. Uh, this isn't me making some argument for... Uh, legalizing uh, 
drugs or selling drugs or anything like that. It's a devastating force within our community. It doesn't need to be there. I'm simply saying that look at how the system operates. You can't have it. We're going to penalize you for it, but we're going to give it to your kid. And here's the thing. When you give it to the kid, eventually over time, the kid becomes alienated in the system. The kid doesn't feel wanted, doesn't feel accepted, doesn't feel like they fit in. They're not in with the regular kids. The other kids are looking at them, making fun of them, and they feel like they're, they've been told they're slow. They've been told they're stupid. They've been told a bunch of other things that's associated with the stigma of special education. And so now they are feeling alienated. And what they're doing is they're pushing this kid further and further and further away from the academic system and increasing their risk of dropping out before they graduate. Now, this is known as the entrance of the uh, school to prison pipeline. Why? Because what we know is when you when you drop out of school before you graduate, when you drop out of high school before you graduate, you are five times more likely to what to become incarcerated. School to prison pipeline. How do we start? We start by alienating them where we automatically drive them out of a system and how does this well a number of things happen when you graduate without getting a diploma you don't have work uh and, and income earning skills that's going to be sufficient enough for you to support yourself much less a family and there are look three basic ways that you support a family as a man you get a job or you own a business that's income that's number one. That's what you all strive for. You all, we're all striving to be income generators, revenue generators, whether it's uh, on a job, whether it's owning a business, whether it's investing or a, 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 a you know, combination of all of them or whatever. But that's the one way. It's only three. The second way is supplements. Having your income supplemented or having you receive income because of a disability because of an inability to work. So some type of government or organizational substance uh, to cover the fact that you're not earning an income. Most men don't qualify for that. Not at a rate that's going to allow them to actually take care of themselves and their families. But that's the second way. The other way is crime. Those are the three ways to bring money. Income, subsidies, crime. Whether it's dope dealing, whether it's jacking and stealing out of uh, clothing stores and, uh, you know, breaking into cars. Uh, they got the big uh, uh, catalytic converter hustle going. Uh, people dying behind that those catalytic converters. Everything is about, hey, nobody's going to sit around and say, I can't get a job or I'm not qualified for a job that pays me enough. So I'm just going to starve and I'm going to let my family starve. No, they're going to do whatever it takes. And normally that ends up putting them in prison. Uh, we have to do a better job of creating opportunities. Number one, to empower them and prepare them. Uh, stop selling them on the idea that the way to win is to go out and get a college degree, which in most instances only puts you in debt and anchors you to that debt so long that by the time you finally get out of the debt, You've wasted years that you should have been building wealth. Again, we are not properly preparing our children because most of us aren't properly prepared. Again, all of these things are things that I've invested in over time. I have the mechanisms and the systems in place to sit up and really take this thing and push it. But I can't do it by myself. I need you guys support. So it's easy to sit up and look. It's easy to criticize. It's easy to talk about what's wrong and what shouldn't happen. The bottom line is this is what's required. Some people are going to be visionaries. Some people are going to be scholars. Some people are going to be the soldiers on the ground. Some people are going to be the ones who finance it. And everybody has a place and all people are needed. But when we sit up and miss the opportunity, when we sit up and we and the thing is, it's not that we don't have it. It's that we have misprioritized what's important. There's billions spent every year on things that bring us nothing of value, that give us no advancement, no progression, nothing but a sense of excitement and enjoyment that is fleeting. And we're facing the same things after that. We've got to get past the escapism.
We simply have to get past the escapism. Well, again, there's a link in the description box. I'm going to clear the description box out so it's real clear. It's going to be a link. Uh, the several different ways that you can give and a link to the organization's website. And that is what I'm going to have in there so that it's real simple. I really and truly am challenging you. If you believe in what I've done, if you subscribe to this channel, you've been on any time, there's something about what I do you believe in. We need your support. Even doing this channel and putting together the things that I've done uh, requires time, requires energy and effort, research. I don't come on and talk about things without researching it, without understanding it. I don't just run off at the mouth. I want to be credible. I want to be uh, verifiable. I want to be able to say, hey, this, and somebody can say, man, I fact-checked him. He's on point. And, and in those times where I may be off, you've seen me retract statements. I'm not perfect, but I, I am definitely well-read, well-researched, well-prepared, uh, and consistently engaged and committed to this. Now I'm challenging you to get behind me. Show some love, show some support. Click the link again through the organization's cash app. But the challenge is on. So this is from me to you. Thank you. As I move on, you guys enjoy the rest of your day. I'm out. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.